know, one of the things that comes up frequently, I've found, especially in Christianity, is this notion of erroneous assumption in which we build our orthodoxy. Most people don't realize this, that uh, by and large, a lot of our assertions in Christianity are not entirely theses. By that, a uh, statement in which we build upon a lot of the things that we assert are more along the lines of an antithesis or a response to something. Now, you've oftentimes heard the notion uh, apologetic response. We have to give, give a defense of our faith. And that's not entirely bad um, when you're trying to uh, answer a contention. And we have so many of those things in Christendom, so many of them that it's almost impossible to answer to all of them. However, the one thing that comes up frequently that I have noticed is this notion of losing one's salvation. Losing one's salvation. I've talked to many people about this uh, over the years, and uh, one of the things that I've concluded is that when people say, well, it's impossible to lose your salvation, what they're really trying to say is that God is not going to take my salvation away from me. And this is true. By way, of, by way of the gift of grace that the Lord has presented before us through Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God is not going to turn around and say, oh, ho, 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 I'm taking that away from you. No, of course not. And I think that's really what people mean when they say that. God is not going to take away our salvation. And instead of actually thinking about what this is saying and what is being said and what is being asserted, it just kind of comes down to the notion of, well, it's impossible to lose my salvation, just like uh, uh, losing my keys or losing my phone or losing my wallet. You know, I can't lose my salvation. I can't misplace it. This also ties into another interesting supposition that you find uh, in a lot of uh, orthodoxy, mostly Protestant orthodoxy, actually. And that is this notion that we really just have no choice but to do anything. We're totally depraved. That sounds nice and all, and it sounds nice to suggest that we are just automatons, that we have no free will, because when you take a very strict reading of Scripture through uh, the lens of Sola Scriptura, you see uh, predestination, everything is, we are all predestined. Well, yeah. Okay, what are we talking about here? We're not really thinking about what these things say, and we're certainly not looking at, you know, the, the rich tradition of church history. We automatically say that we cannot help but sin. We have no choice. We are so depraved that it is only by God's grace that we aren't sinning as bad as we could. Even myself, right now, I am in sin. I am sitting by speaking into this microphone, onto this cassette tape, looking at my wife. Everything that I'm doing is sinful. I am just a wretch. I am just a worm. I am the scum on the back of a worm. And thank you, Martin Luther. Thank you so much for that flattery, for that nonsensical supposition. We get it. We suck. All right, cool. Now, let's get back to reality for a minute. We have to ask these questions, you know. Am I sinning constantly? The answer is no. God did not come here just to make this blanket statement. God came here for something very objective, and that is the things that we objectively and have assuredly done. Using things outside of propriety, being outside of propriety, outside of the proper context and order of things. We have a list, you know, the seven deadly sins. And, uh, and you know, that's the thing that God came here for. And I, I asked this to a friend once. I said, so you're telling me if I cross the street, I am automatically sinning. Well, yes, you couldn't do that as perfectly as possible. But what if God had commanded me to walk across the street? Well, it doesn't matter because if, if, if. I'm like, oh, no, 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 hold on. If God asks me to walk, if God commands me to walk across the street and I, in due diligence, within a reasonable amount of time and assertion, cross the street, have I not fulfilled God's will? Uh, well, well, what if a chasm? Well, if God commands me to walk across the street and then a chasm opens in front of me uh, and I suddenly find myself unable to cross the street, I kind of can't do a whole lot at this point. 
you know. Now, I would say that, you know, if I crossed the street and maybe I found somebody along the way to, uh, to, to help them, you know, I mean, it is not a sin to do good. You know, this is what the Pharisees uh, condemned Jesus for, and this is what Jesus turned around and said, uh, it's not a sin to do good, you know. Eating on the whole Sabbath thing. It is good to do good. We want to do good. That's the point. That's not the, the point of, you know, resting. Now, if I turned around and said, you know, oh, I'm just going to lollygag across the street, and I'm going to go da 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 and I'm just going to take it, you know, because God says, hey, I want you to cross the street. And I say, okay, well, I'm just, uh, let, me, let, me, uh, let me play my video game on my iPhone a little bit longer. Let me listen to some music on, uh, on Spotify or whatever. Let me just do the thing. It's like, okay, yes, now all of a sudden I have found myself in sin because I'm not doing uh, what I have been commanded or prompted to do in a, in a readily and reasonable fashion. You can say that about a lot of things in how we approach what is sinful, what is good, what is right, what is true, etc., etc., etc. But when you start off with the premise that nothing you can do is good, that your that your righteousness is like filthy rags, which yes, there is context to that. My righteousness compared to uh, God's is entirely like filthy rags. That doesn't mean that uh, my the righteousness that I am I am uh, given, the righteousness that I wrap myself in. My own personal, uh, the, excuse me, not my own personal righteousness, but the righteousness of God that I'm to wrap myself in is not like filthy rags. My own, yes. God's, no. My own, yes. God's, no. And I am to be Christ-like. I am to wrap myself in God's righteousness. So how does this all get back to the concept of, is it possible to lose your salvation? That's an interesting one. We've already established that it's not like losing your keys, and we've already established that God is not going to just take it away from me because he's having a bad day, however you have a bad day in eternity, or because I did something wrong. You see, we've been given autonomy. We've, we've been given these brains to think about things, and we're not really doing that anymore. We just sit down and we say, I read it, and it is so, and that's the way it is. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Because otherwise, if it wasn't that complicated, Paul would not have said what he said, which is that it is impossible to be redeemed if you have tasted the fruits and you have turned away from them. And we're not talking about just a simple, okay, I, I kind of found myself into a sinful proclivity. We're talking about a willful turnaround. A willful turnaround. We are talking about somebody who has willfully turned around and said to God, no, no. And we're not even talking about somebody who's got a bug up their backside, which, by the way, we'd be talking about me in that particular context. Because, you see, I kind of I kind of started down that road a long time ago. I kind of started down that road a long time ago. And praise the Lord that he, he kind of said, okay, you, you, you took a step on that road. And boy, what a step. You took a step on that road. But even so, I never denied Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I never denied anything of the truth. I never denied these things. I always knew. It's like I'm just throwing a temper tantrum. And praise the Lord that I threw just a miniature temper tantrum. And God help me that I threw a miniature temper tantrum. And to even call it a temper tantrum is an understatement beyond reproach. Anyways, the question remains... What does this actually mean? Are we to believe that because we have no autonomy, we can do nothing, that it's just impossible to deny one's salvation, to deny one's spiritual gift? Oh, that would fly in the face of irresistible grace. Once God has got you, it's, it's impossible. you got irresistible, yeah, right? Nonsense. Nonsense. You see, here's the funny thing about that one. You know, right now at my age, I know where I'm at. I can't tell you where I'm going to be in 40 years from now, or, or even, or, or excuse me, uh, 10 years from now, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. I've got a whole couple lifetimes ahead of me. And I'm not going to be so bold to say that I will never, I will never. But you see, when you start to say you will never, you know, you kind of get this, you get this thing in your head, you know, that you're above reproach in a way, that you're above the normal proclivities of human existence. You start to assume certain things. 
I will never. It'll never. And and you've heard people say the phrase, it will never, I could never. Oh, boy. <laughs> never. No, what you're saying is that likely you've never been presented with the opportunity to do, or you've never actually been faced with the cir circumstance that would cause you to actually have to choose uh, A or B. Don't ever say never. Now, we could make certain searches. Maybe it's unlikely. It's highly improbable. But the truth of the matter is, saying never kind of puts you on this uh, pedestal. Kind of fills you up with a little bit of a thing called hubris. A little bit of pride. Because we know pride comes before every fall. Is it possible that in my own pride and arrogance that I could just look at God one day and say, you, I'm done. I want nothing to do with you. And yes, I use that language because that is the language that a person at that position uses. I've had enough. We're not talking about the four seed type people. And by that, for reference, we're talking about the, the, the seed sower who, who you know, rocky so, uh, road, rocky soil, shallow soil, and then deep roots. We're not talking about those. This is something special. This is something very, very, very special. We're talking about a person who has been inundated in the church. We are talking about a person who knows the Lord, and I mean knows the Lord, has firsthand experience and recognizable grace of the Lord. For whatever reasons in the world, I can't answer that this person just kind of goes south. And by south, I mean as far south as a person can possibly humanly go. And by as far south, I mean somebody who turned around and made it their life's ambition. Life's ambition to work against God. Can that person not necessarily lose their salvation, but are they not effectively throwing it away? And the answer to that is yes, it is. It is entirely possible. Well, how can that possibly be, right? Irresistible grace. Well, maybe irresistible grace is just nonsense. Kind of like the whole tulip thing is nonsense. Kind of like the whole notion that we have no autonomy or no agency. That's all nonsense, too. We have these things. We were created to have these things. We were created to be thinkers and doers and reasonable and rational. Not by our own, but by God's. By God's standard, we were created for these things. Not by our own. It is by our own standard that we got into the mess that we are in now in this world in which we live in. I don't know why this is a difficult concept to wrap our heads around, but some people really just don't want to think about these things that deeply. They'd like to turn around and they'd like to try to use the Bible in a legalistic manner. They don't want to build on it. They want to stay right in there, which is fine. Good for them. I'm not disputing their Christianity, but their orthodoxy does leave a little to be desired for. Actually, it leaves much to be desired for. And when I say orthodoxy, what I mean by that is simply right teaching. And orthopraxy just means how we put into practice that teaching. And you could say, you could say that there are three general orthodoxies. You have Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Orthodoxy, also known as uh, Roman Catholicism, which is Catholicism rebranded, and finally Protestant Orthodoxy. Yes, Protestants have an orthodoxy. There's this kind of an unorthodoxy, if you will, if you will. But getting back to it for a minute, let's talk about the type of person that might actually commit spiritual suicide. It's, un it's unconscionable. It's insane to think about. Well, here's the thing. I've lived a while on this planet, and I've heard a lot of stories, listened to the old men. I've listened to men tell stories of other men who have said, if you had told me not 10 years ago, that I would be sitting in this jail cell for this heinous act that I've committed, I would have looked at you and laughed, saying, don't you know me? You don't know where life is going to bring you. You don't know what situations are going to be thrown at you. You put somebody in the room with the right person at the right time in the right frame of mind, and all sorts of terrible things can happen. I know this. I've been there. Done that. 
man, I, I played the self-destruction game with a sense of humor with the best of them. Praise the Lord, I didn't go as far as I could have gone. But boy, did I make a mess of a lot of things. Yes, I did. The Lord stopped me just short of the bottom. But this still goes on to the question. Spiritual suicide? Yes. Just as much as a man or a woman can find themselves in any particular situation or circumstance and find themselves, you know, metaphorically holding the gun to their head. Yes. And how can that happen? Oh, there's a lot of ways it could happen. One of which is thinking that you're better than what you really are. That you're, you're, you're supposed to be over here. That's the hubris thing. But you know, sometimes we like to think we understand things so clearly that we, that we have a grasp on things so tightly that because what happens doesn't match our understanding or our line of thinking or our reasoning, we just kind of turn around, bend over, give the finger to God and say, to hell with you. I want nothing to do with you. And then you get so bitter and so angry and so frustrated. You start to lose your friends. You start to lose your community. You start to lose your faith. You start to throw it away, not because of anything God did, but because of how you understood God. And I see it all the time. Now, I'm not saying that the people that I'm seeing are committing spiritual suicide. Quite frankly, I think a majority of the people that we're seeing nowadays who are walking away from the church are just getting so bent out of shape because of the church's answer to a lot of things because it's not creating people to think and reason, but to have a faith that even God didn't even expect people to have. Now, what does that mean? I mean, let's be honest. It's not like God's will is so beyond our grasp. He literally asserted it to us. He literally told it to us. His will is achievable. Otherwise, he would not have commanded us to do it. <laughs> God is not going to dangle a carrot in front of us. Not in the slightest bit. God wants us to be good. He wants us to repent from the evil that we have done. Good and evil really aren't that complex when you think about it. Now, the reasons that lead us to doing evil can sometimes be a little bit complicated. Sure. But when you start to have certain notions about reality in life, when you start to assert certain things that are just flat out untrue and they're met with the, expect, uh, the, the reality and the truth of things kind of puts you into this fix. What is my faith worth? What are my what are my efforts worth? What is any of this worth? If at the end of the day everything that I hold to be true is false. False in the sense that false in the sense that my understanding was inaccurate. That breaks a lot of people. That turns a lot of good men and women into something vile. Sometimes that causes people to commit a spiritual suicide. And we're not talking, again, the type of person who finds themselves in a compromising position. We're not talking about that. You know, I'm not a Christian. Because, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, I'm just going to call myself this. No, I am one because I recognize the truth and veracity and the grace behind it and the gift behind it. I recognize my own iniquity, how I have caused chaos and destruction, not only in my own life, but in the lives of others because of these things, because of this chaos and iniquity. I would rather do good. And people say, well, we can have world peace. Yes, world peace, be held accountable for your own actions. Recognize the chaos and destruction that you're doing in your own life. And tell God you're sorry. Lord, I'm sorry for these things that I have done, or I've taken that which you have given me, and I've twisted and manipulated it for my own selfish desires. It's pretty basic. 
But the type of person that would commit spiritual suicide, man, that's something you really got to excel at. It's almost enviable in a way that you're so angry, so bitter, so hurt that you spend a lifetime, the end of your days, kicking against the wind. Can, can that be? Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. When you start to realize the, 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 the sh- sheer power and ability that the Lord has given us, yes, it is possible. You know? I mean, even if we were to assert something that uh, Lucifer himself stood before God, and yet he fell. Well, if an angel who stood before God, and th- this is depending on how you want to take that verse, you know, if he was standing before God and he literally fell, we're not even standing in front of God. And yet we could still turn our, turn our face to him willingly, willfully. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure, we can do that. Did not Judas will, willfully do that? Is it not the mark of the Christian? And I hear this a lot, too, and this kind of counters into it. Well, as a Christian, you can't do whatever you want to do. No, no, you're missing the mark. You're missing the point. It's not about doing whatever we want to do. We can do whatever we want to do. The question is, do we understand why and what it is we want to be doing? You know, sure, I can go off and do a lot of terrible things right now, but do I recognize that there is no benefit to these things? For the Christian, what we ought to be doing is aligning our wills to God to do good and to use all things in propriety. So yes, it is reasonable to say that we align our wills to God so that way all things that have been given unto us for seeking that kingdom of heaven first, all things shall be given unto us. We want to seek the goodness and grace of God first so that way we can use all things to glorify him and he turn will glorify us. It's almost like there's an ancient archetypal image that springs to mind when you start to think about these things. But can I get mad at God? Yes. Anyone could. And we must be careful because when we start to deny, when we start to deny what is possible, when we start to say things like, oh, no, 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 that's not impo- that, that's entirely possible. You could never do that. No. Oh, yes, you could. Because that's when evil starts to get its foothold into you. That's when those little hooks start to pierce in your, in your side and you start to get pulled in a direction. When you start to think that you, you could never have, that, that could never happen to you, that you are somehow above that or it's impossible. And is that a scary thought? Oh, yes, it is. It is a very scary thought. It is a terrifying thought to realize, oh, my, I am capable. I need to keep that in check. I need to make sure I don't go down that road with the grace and the mercy of the Lord that has been given to me in the strength of the Holy Spirit. I must be cognizant of it. I must recognize these things, and I must constantly be examining myself. It's almost like we were commanded to do that. To temetnos, know yourself. Recognize who you are. Recognize that which God has made good, that for whatever reasons has been twisted into evil, recognize all of these things. But do not be so prideful to think that you are above reproach. And do not think you are so good that at some point in life you very well could find yourself in a place where you're standing on the edge of some metaphysical cliff, looking down into the abyss, and in a moment of profound arrogance and hopelessness. You jump off that cliff. Oh, yes. Yes, you could find yourself in that position if you're not careful. And that's why Paul tells us it's impossible to return. We're not going to recrucify Christ on your behalf. 
Huh, yeah, you're, you're going to stumble along the way. That's fine. But recognize that stumbling. Recognize what it means. Recognize where you're at. Be cognizant of these realities. Yeah, you, you'll stumble, assuredly. I, liked, I like it said very well. I'm not necessarily a Christian because it's suddenly instantly going to make me sinless. I am a Christian, so that way I can be forgiven of those sins that I've committed and hopefully receive the grace of God to perhaps sin less. Anyways, folks, my name is John, and this has been Hovering Over the Deep. I wanted to try something a little bit different. I'm really trying to get back into this. Thank you for taking the time to listen. And I hope you glean something from this. Until next time, folks, I bid you good day and God bless. <laughs>